It is so great to be with you guys this morning. If you got a Bible, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. We'll show some of this on the screen as well. While you're turning there, I just want to say I love your pastor. You guys have a great pastor. You do. (coughs) And even though I say that at every church, this time is different. I really, there's something, there's a bit of a, yeah. No. (laughs) I consider Pastor Jeff one of my closest friends, easily in the top 30 to 40, <laughs> five. And so, so it's great to be here. But Pastor Jeff, Pastor Rob, Pat, Alex, you, you have a great team here. And it was great to be with your men on your men's retreat. Anybody here from, yeah, <laughs> yeah. thank you both of you. <laughs> the others are like, oh, he's preaching, I ain't going, forget it, all right. Uh, It's great to be here. I want to tell you my story real fast because it's a testimony of his story. Uh, I got saved when I was 23 years old, running a comedy club in Western Canada. Had about 20 comedians working for me. I was a DJ on a radio station. Had a TV show. I thought I had it all going for me. I was dating a Mormon girl. I was going to get married. I wasn't a Christian. And then she dumped me. Come on, guys. That's cold. Thank thank you, guy in front row. That's (laughs) That's good. I gave him like 10 bucks for that awe. Thanks, guys. You're like, it was years ago. Get over it. But anyway, um, yeah, I walked into a church service. Basically, uh, a girl invited me. I thought we were going clubbing that night. She said, no, I'm going to this thing called Refiner's Fire. I said, that's not a church, is it? She goes, yeah, it is, but it's really cool. Anybody else fall for that line? Okay, that's what got me into a church. I sat in the back row. I wore dark sunglasses and a baseball cap pulled down because I didn't want anyone to see me, whereas the Italians say, I didn't want to get made at a church service. And so I slumped down in the back row. The preacher got up on stage. He got in a pulpit like this, opened his Bible. He looked up. There's about 250 young adults in the room. And he goes, it's great to see you guys today. Hey, Joel Turner's with us. And 250 people turned around. Spurgeon said I was caught by the hound of heaven. That's how it felt for me. This guy took me out, poured into my life, led me to the Lord. Uh, Not too long after that, I took a pretty girl to the same service who wasn't a Christian also. I was sharing the gospel with her. And uh, that's my now wife. And basically, she started crying in the service. I led her into a back room, prayed with her to receive Jesus. So that was super exciting, leading my wife to the Lord. And then I waited 24 hours before asking her out. Because you don't, you don't want to rush into that, guys. You don't, you know, give them some time to grow. You know what I mean? They just give them some time to grow with the Lord. Don't rush into that. But today I want to talk about the devotional life. So let's read this verse and we'll pray and dive right in. Mark 1, 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out, this is Jesus, and departed to a solitary place and there he prayed. Father, we pray today for nothing short of your spirit coming and moving upon our hearts as the word is opened. Lord, we're not here for information, but transformation. We are in a desperate, dying, hurting world, Lord, and we need those who know the Lord to rise up, to be filled with your spirit, to go out, taking your word as ambassadors in this place. So would you come right now, Lord? We pray that you would move upon hearts for everyone listening, watching, or presently here. Would you touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit? It's not my words, Lord. It's your word that goes forth and sent out and will accomplish. And so I pray right now that you, Jesus, would do a mighty work through your spirit for God's glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. Audience participation. What's the best meal or restaurant you've ever had? Okay, shout it out on three. Ready? One, two, three, go. (laughs) There's always one. Burger King. I'm like, okay. All right. And your wife's sitting next to you. Okay. Let's, Let's talk after or at least meet with one of the pastors four times this week. Listen, it's been a rough month. Okay, yeah, I understand that. I think we'd all agree. Not every meal is a 10 out of 10, not if you know what I'm saying, okay? Not every meal is a 10 out of a 10. (laughs) The same guy's like, "Uh, it is when my wife cooks, trying to redeem yourself now, okay, yeah. I I mean, whenever my wife goes away, do you guys have this? Anybody have this? We have four kids. Whenever my wife leaves for like a trip, she went on a women's retreat recently. She's amazing. She'll say, honey, I made seven meals for you. They're all frozen in the freezer. Anyone have a wife like this? They're all frozen in the freezer. They're all vegan. The kids are going to love them, right? And as soon as she leaves, we like wait, and then we're like, pizza! 
Come on, come on, where's my man at? You know what I'm talking. Oh no, don't pretend you don't do it. You're like, no, sweetheart, we eat all the veggies in the house. No, you don't. Not every meal is a 10, but you don't stop eating because it's not a 10. You don't stop eating because, you know, you can't remember every single meal. Well, I don't remember every meal. That would be silly. Lady wrote to an article uh, to Dear Abby. She said, I've decided to quit my church. She said, for 30 years, I can't remember a single sermon. The columnist wrote back. She said, I've decided to quit eating. For 30 years, I can't remember a single meal. You get the point, right? It's ridiculous. When we're talking about the devotional life, when we're talking about devotions as we are this morning, quiet time, pick your word, devos, prayer time, Bible time, this is associated in the scripture with consuming physical food and specifically bread that feeds your soul with spiritual meals. So hold that thought. I want you, if you will, before we dive into our teaching, in a sense, picture a table in a, a fine dining restaurant with a tablecloth and kind of pick your own setting here. Maybe there's china and glass and place settings. And at the table, a guy waits in a tuxedo to meet with you. And let's just say for the picture, it's God's son, Jesus. How excited would you be if I said, listen, tomorrow morning, you get to meet Jesus in a dining room. He's going to wait for you. And there he is. He's excited to meet together with you, to speak to you, to have fellowship with you. Friends, this is, I think, the picture that the Lord wants to put in your heart today and in your minds is that we still have this opportunity to meet with God every single morning, every day without fail, and he is there waiting and ready to meet with us. And the sense I get is that we, as a church, as individuals, are to arrive and meet with him in expectation that he'll talk with us. Friends, I believe the number one cause of decline in both modern in the modern church and in the believer's life is actually down to their devotional life, which is why God put it on my heart to put this in here. Everything, everything rises and falls in your time with the Lord. And this is so important to talk about today. Why is that? Because you have books coming out of the emergent church recently, like Sacred Pathways, this book that goes to great lengths to tell you prayer and Bible reading. Well, that's just one way to connect with God, that's called the traditional way. But we should have less emphasis on this because after all, there are eight other spiritual pathways that you can connect with to God. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying there's not ways that you connect with God. Man, I live out in a beautiful place, you know, Google Lake Louise or Banff sometime, not now on your phone. But listen, sometime do it and you'll see it's a gorgeous place. And yes, there is a great thing about being out in the environment. But what we're try- what's happening today a lot in the modern churches, they're moving away from from saying, man, you don't need to emphasize the word of God or prayer because there's other ways you can connect with God. You know, if you get your breathing right and you sit by a stream, you're good to go. Well, that is not what God's word says. And you, friends, will never be greater, I promise you, than your prayer life or your time in God's word. Please jot that down, write that somewhere. You will not, you cannot go higher than your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's why this hit my heart when praying about what to speak about. God's word says it this way. My word will not return void. Just about every other avenue of life will return void, won't it? You think even some of your checks return void. But listen, (laughs) that was personal for two people right there. Okay, how does he know? Okay, listen, someone told me. Um, But the word of God will not return void. It will go out and accomplish that what it's sent to do. Every time you feast on God's word, every time you spend time with Jesus, every time you pray, you meet with him in that restaurant and there is a a, a download, whether you felt it or not. Some of you are like, well, I don't really feel it right now. Those meals are still affecting you. They're still changing you. And it maybe doesn't always hit you like a 10, but you don't quit eating. That would be, um, how should we say, in Espanol, estupido. See? I worked on that in the mirror this morning. I'm like, I love California. People speak Spanish there. And she's like, honey, you might get it wrong. I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, that's what Google's for. So anyway. (laughs) 
Jesus said there is a food that goes to everlasting life. That is the food I want. Don't you, church? That's what we're going to talk about. Jesus knew the importance of time with the Father. That's why here in Mark 1, 35, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Did you see that? Three things. Number one, it was in the morning. <laughs> this is the first service. You're all like, yes, it was. <laughs> right? You're like, this sermon's for the last service. Those people are lazy. Okay, well, now, hold on. <laughs> Sleeping in. Okay, yeah, I get it. But it was in the morning. Number two, he got away. And number three, he got alone and met with God. Now, some people say, I got four kids. I can't get alone and meet with God. I just want to say, even in our busy age of your phone is ringing before you get down and spend time with Jesus, even in this day, you can do it. You can do it. John Wesley's mom, Susanna, had 10 kids. Her quiet place, ladies, this is for someone in here, she threw her apron over her head. And the kids, when, she, when they saw mom had her apron over her head, they're like, oh, she's having quiet time. Then there was no quiet time. It was just the signal for right now, don't talk to me because I'm talking to my father. Do you see that? Friends, God wants to meet you every day. This is not a legalistic, you should. This is a you get to. And I think that hurts us sometimes. We talk about devotions. People are like, oh, yeah, devos. Yeah, they haven't been good lately. And we talk about a thing, devotions, instead of the thing that God is looking for, which is devotion. That is what God is after. And God's not like, and, and, you know, some people have this idea that if I don't do them, you know, I don't show up in the morning and meet with him, well, then, you know, like, he's going to flip the table and he's mad. That is not the picture of Jesus through the scriptures. The picture is that he's waiting, expectant, excited. Tomorrow morning, friends. And if you don't come, then it's like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to meet with her. Tomorrow I'm going to meet with him. That is the heart that God has for you. And so there is a sadness, sure, but there's a desire again. God is after devotion, not devotions. Here's the problem. I think a lot of times we're either not meeting with God or we come selfishly to God, and then we wonder why we don't get as much out of it. Let me show you what I mean. I'm doing the swipey thing. Ah, there it is. Wow, this is a powerful setup. All right. Okay. <laughs> There's all these screens. I'm like, I'm going to ruin something. I know I am. But anyway, Psalm 37, verse 4. Look what it says. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. This is one of the most, I think, misinterpreted verses. It really is. Let me tell you why. A lot of people take this first, particularly the young adults that I get to minister to. A lot of them are like, hey, Pastor Joel, I did that contractual thing with Psalm 37, 4. Well, what do you mean? They're like, well, I, I came to God so that I would get what I want, and it didn't work out. Do you see the problem with that? <laughs> They're like, I came to God. I'm like, God, where's my iPhone I asked for? Where's the sports car I'm looking for? <laughs> Where, that Lord, I that girl I prayed for, where is she? I even told you the hair color, but she hasn't come along yet. What's going on? And so the first way to translate this is contractual. If I do this, then he has to do this. And people get confused why it doesn't work. So a lot of times it sort of tap out on devotions. The second way is if I delight myself in him and truly try to delight in him, then as a byproduct... I'll get the things I want, but it's still manipulation. The one is where you trick yourself to do the right thing. The goal may be delighting in him, but still in the back of your mind, you have your desires as the end result. Let me tell you the proper approach to God. When the Bible says delight yourself also in the Lord, the article is the Lord, not what you want. The direction is the Lord, not your desires. And the result is, he gives you what? The desires. You could almost insert the word there in commentator form, the true desires of your heart. That's the correct interpretation. I go to him not on the basis, friends, of what I want, but on the basis of relationship, on the basis of who he is, of what he's done on the cross for me. That he conquered Satan's sin, death, demons, the grave, and hell. That he went to meet be at the right hand of the Father, that he is praying, Hebrews says, daily for you, that he is willing to meet with you every day, that he's excited to have fellowship with you, and that he is your soon coming king. I go on to him on the basis of who he is, on the basis of him, and then amazing things happen, and here's what happens. He does give me the true desires of my heart, 
and it's him. See, you, sometimes you think satisfaction is determinant on getting what you want in life. But what if you've been duped? What if the enemy of your soul has sold you on this idea that true satisfaction is you getting what you want? Think about that for a second. What if he's sold you on that? Whereas in actuality, what God says is, I will give you new desires. I will give you better ones, not selfish ones, so that when you keep coming to me, eventually you figure out what? All these other things pale in comparison to the true desire of your heart. And I believe this of every person on planet Earth or whoever have, has lived. The true desire of their heart is actually Jesus. And when they discover it, like I did years ago, they get saved from their selfishness, not just their sins. Amen. I, I think this is perfectly illustrated in the crowds who followed after Jesus as he fed the 5,000 with bread. So if you can, turn with me to John 6. We're going to look at that. I want to show you something that literally changed my life. You can hold my calls. Thank you. Uh, John 6. John 6, verse 30. So bad. Therefore they said to him, <laughs> don't you love the crowds that follow Jesus? They're just great because they're us. Okay. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? What has he just done? He just fed 5,000 people. This is classic, isn't it? This is us. This is you and me, friend. Jesus feeds 5,000. Jesus does something amazing in your life. What's the next thing you say? Glory to God. Praise to God. No, no, no. What's next, Lord? Lord, could you do something spectacular so that I know that it's you? He just fed 5,000, and they're like, could you perform some trick? Okay, come on, dance, monkey. That's what they're doing. They're basically saying, how do we get free food? Hey, we want to follow you, Jesus, but only if you give us the desires of our hearts, free food. Hey, we want to follow you. Listen, and now catch this, because this might apply to you today. See, guys, they didn't really want Jesus for Jesus. If you've got a pen, jot this down. Nobody uses a pen anymore. Put this in your phone. Okay, listen. <laughs> Young adults are like, what is this pen you speak of? But anyway, um, <laughs> you're Googling it. Okay, now listen. They didn't really want Jesus for Jesus. Don't miss this. They wanted Jesus for what he would do for them. Wow. Did you hear that? They came to Jesus and asked him to produce what they wanted, but they didn't really want him. Anybody busted by that I am I'm busted by that how many times I've been like hey Lord it's me Joel I need a new car or Lord can you change my wife's attitude or <laughs> she's coming to the next service that's why I said it in this one <laughs> Lord can you grow my hair back somehow um you did it for Samson do it again Lord okay but <laughs> what about me <laughs> you know and God is like Joel what about me look at all I've done in your life and you're coming to me again for what you want? What about us? Because I want relationship. Verse 31, our fathers, these guys get funnier, our fathers ate the manna in the desert, the bread that came down from heaven. As it is written, he gave them bread. How about we advance that for you? There we go. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Here's what they're saying. Hey, Moses gave us bread when we wanted it. Can you? I need you to be my genie in the bottle, Lord. If you will just do the things I'm asking you, we're good. We're good. That, that doesn't even work in a marriage, does it? <laughs> like, sweetheart, I don't understand. I wrote a list of things. Ow, okay, all right. It doesn't. And it doesn't work in your walk with the Lord. Verse 32, Jesus is so patient. I would not have been this patient. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. Here's Jesus' response. Um, people, really? You think Moses was the superhero that gave you bread from heaven? Like that was his power? He was bread man? Like the Avenger bread man, it just bagels, boom, there you go. Manna, boom. Like, is that really what you think? Do you think Moses was the bread producer in the Old Testament? That's what Jesus is saying. Now stay with this. Watch this. Verse 33. For the bread of God is he 
You might want to circle that. He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now watch this. If the bread of God is a he, not a loaf. Do you see that, church? I didn't write that. God said that. The bread of God is he that comes down and gives real life. See, the real life in this world is not making it famous. It's not having money. It's not, oh, if I could just get to travel to all my dream destinations. Did you know the people with real power in this life, this is going to encourage you, are not the government officials, not the business leaders. No, friends, with, according to the Bible, the people with real power in this life are those connected in relationship to, close to, the God of all power who gives eternal life. That right now is the real power on earth. It is. Listen, your country can go to war with Iran. Your politics can go haywire. Hollywood can keep getting bigger houses. Who cares? The real power is with God and the people who spend time in devotion to God. Please, if you take anything from today, take that. Everybody in this world wants to get to connected to something that they think is powerful, don't they? I mean, in Canada, it's really funny. Like the people on the right side of our nation, we're all like, oh, God bless them. Yeah, oh, Toronto, God bless them. You know, I was born there, but I live on the left side now, just to make it easy for you people. And, and so we're like, well, God bless them. That's great. They're doing well in basketball. Yay. <laughs> then they start winning and winning and winning, and now all of a sudden, everybody's a Raptors fan. It's like, oh, I'm a Raptors fan. No, you're not. How do you spell Raptor? Uh, R-A-P-T-U-R-E. That's Rapture. <laughs> Whatever. You know, it's like, they're called bandwagon supporters. Fairweather fans. They're people that show up when things are good because everyone wants to get connected, listen, to real power. The real power on planet Earth is with those who are connected to the real planet Earth. Plan, power after planet earth that's it that's the connection you want you want to go buy a shirt we got all these canadians buying we the north shirts and don't get me wrong i bought them too but listen <laughs> uh, shoot yourself in the foot but no but but you understand what i'm saying the real power is those who are connected to the real power which is jesus verse 34 they said to him lord give us this bread always classic isn't it Oh, yeah, Lord, hit, hit me up. Hook a brother up. I mean, they're missing it, just like we would have if we were there. They're like, bread forever? Yes. Yes, me, Lord, choose me. in and out burger whenever I want it, I'll take that. Yeah, every time if I walked in there and it was free, I'd be like, glory, this is awesome. But that is so typical of us. Rather than basking in who he is right in front of us, we're like, hit me again, Lord, I want the next thing. Don't you think our Bible should actually show us all the places Jesus shook his head? Wouldn't that be fun? I mean, they obviously Jesus was like, no, don't put those in. But don't you think every time Peter opens his mouth, he's like, I don't know about that. Don't you think? He's so patient. I'm so not. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, and this is the no duh moment, ready? I... <laughs> And the bread of life. It's me. The thing you should be feasting on is not some temporal food that you're like, oh, that was good, oh, it's gone. It's me. I'm right here. I'm right here in front of you. It's me. I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Who's producing manna, church? Sunday school answer? Jesus. Yeah, it's good you're scared to answer, aren't you? You're like, Jesus. Yes, every Sunday school answer is the same. Anyway, he's like, you're looking at the manna giver. I am the one. Now, here's what struck me about devotions. I read this years ago after I came to Christ, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Where's that passage about manna in the Bible? Well, it's Exodus 16. And since the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible, I was like, well, wait a minute. If Jesus cross-references, classic preacher move, cross-references Exodus 16 as a commentary on John 6, stay with me, then maybe Exodus 16 is, or sorry, if he 
cross-references it as a commentary on what he's talking about, then maybe if we jump over to Exodus 16, we can see a cross-reference on the devotional life. And I think we do. I think we do. Check it out. And I remember the morning I saw this. And it's copyright, so you can't produce a book out of it. But listen, (laughs) I began to puzzle it out. And so stay with me. Look at this. Exodus 16, verse 1. And they journeyed from Elam. And all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Two times the word wilderness comes up. What do you picture when you see wilderness? Here's what I picture. Dry, barren, wasteful land. This is me when I don't have fresh manna from heaven, amen? When I decide that I'm just going to go without the word of God for a bit or without prayer for a word, things get dry. It's a wilderness of sin. And guess what happens when we're not in God's word? We start doing what? Look at the end of verse 2. We start complaining. Well, this guy, that, and this problem, and if she just got it together, and why can't they sing the song I like on Sunday? (laughs) The lights are too bright in here. Why did they go with Beauty and the Beast chandeliers? Anyway, listen. (laughs) Some of y'all thought it. No one said it. You thought it. It's between you and Jesus, okay? I just pointed out. Just one beggar helping another beggar find free bread. All right, here we go. But you get what I'm saying. This is a commentary. When I'm not in God's word and I'm not prayer, I'm not meeting him consistently, I get all complainy. So do you. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Now look at the parallels between the devotional life. Look at verse 4. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota. What's it say, church? Every day. Not Sunday Right, Monday, start of the week, I always, you know, do, I read something in the Bible on Monday, Pastor. No, no, every day. And it's a certain quota. That I may, but then he says this line, that I may test them. You know, I used to read Exodus 16 after I got saved. To be honest, you know, it's the word of God, so it's not boring. But to be honest, I wasn't getting it. I was like, okay, great, they got bread from heaven. Why are we taking a whole chapter on this? The bottom line is, when you start looking at it through the eyes of what Jesus did when he interpreted it, you see it's, it's our devotional life. Now, the, the other thing I see is it's a test. God tests you. See if I will not pour open, open the windows of heaven and pour out. There's tests in the Bible. Did you know that? Your devotional life is a test. Verse 7. Now, some of you are going to not like this. You ready? Verse 7. <laughs> here, let's jump along here. Verse 7. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. Verse 8b. And in the morning bread to the full. Verse 12b, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Verse 13b, and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. This is cool. This is cool. Why? Because in verse 12, what do you see? Well, first we see in the morning, in the morning, in the morning, in the morning. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, come on, man. I I work at 5 a.m. in the morning. I do devos at night. That's great. That's great. I'm just saying there's something about taking out taking a fresh start to the day and letting the Lord be the first one to write on it. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm not going to get all legalistic. Well, if you don't do it in the morning, da, 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 who cares? Listen, start your day with Jesus. Can we get an amen on that? Amen. It's simple, right? But look at the benefits, he says. Verse 12, you'll be filled. That's God's desire. Some people are like, oh, devotions, I should read my Bible. God is like, I want to fill you. And then what does he say? You shall know that I am the Lord God. The best time with the Lord is when you come out of it going, wow, Lord, I feel like I know you more now. I feel like I know you more now. Verse 13, the dew lay all around the camp. That's not there by accident. Dew in the Bible is a picture of refreshment. I can't remember the reference right now, but I think it's Psalm 133 or 138. 19 of you will email me after, but listen. He says, behold how good it is when brethren get together in in community it's like oil being poured over the beard of Aaron he says it's like dew on Mount Hermon or Hermon if you want to say it properly what is dew a picture of in the Bible refreshment 
Because when you come together in fellowship like you're doing this morning, you get a refreshment from it. And when you gather together in my word, he says it's going to be like dew in the morning. There's going to be, God is not wanting to refrain you, restrain you. He's wanting to refresh you. Tomorrow morning is not about, oh, it's my duty. It's your blessing to get alone with the Lord. It says verse 16, in verse 16, he says, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. That's interesting. Why? Because your need is different from your friend's need. Okay? Because sometimes what happens is we compare our devotional lives with these great women and men of God, but we didn't have the turmoil that their lives were in that pushed them to that devotional life. Right? We're like, oh, Martin Luther prayed for three hours. I'm going to try that once. Right? You're like, ah. And your wife's like, how'd your three hours sleep go? That was sleep brand. It's sort of this new thing I'm trying. So don't compare because everyone has a different need. What you need is different from the person beside you. And that means don't post how you just, I just went on a 24-day fast, just water. Water in Jesus. Hashtag try it if you're spiritual. No, listen. Come on, y'all. Don't compare. Your need's different. I have till five after, is that right? Okay, good. Gosh, I'm halfway. I'm kidding. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Now listen to this. One omer for each person according to the number of persons. Watch this. I love this. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. Men, are you ready? It is your responsibility to not just come and have your quiet time and your devos and your time with the Lord for you only. Did you know that? Because in Exodus 16, the man was called by God to go gather the bread from heaven. It's a picture of who? Much better, much better. And he had to gather what he needed, and he didn't just gather it for himself. He gathered it for everyone in his house. You don't just do devos, man, for you. You do them for your whole family. On any given day, my kids should be able to say, Dad, what'd you study in God's Word? And they started to do it a couple years back. What'd you get out of devotions this morning, Dad? You know? Now you're like, oh, uh, okay, let me see now. Uh, <laughs> discipline your boys. Hard. No, no. I don't. <laughs> you gather for everyone behind you. Now I'm going to show you my favorite verse in the entire Bible on devotions. Exodus 16, 21. If you read this, you'd think, obscure, don't really get it, but let's check it out. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. Now that you look at it through the eyes of the devotional life, I wonder if you can see this. In John 15, 5, just quickly, Jesus said, and you know what, I'm, I'm not going to turn there, I'm going to stay back here, but here's what it says. Jesus said, abide in me, and I in you, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, abide means to dwell with or to hang out, spend time with. And he says in that passage that if we don't dwell with, abide, hang out with Jesus, then we are withered. Same word in Exodus, interesting. In the wilderness of sin... In the wilderness, we get dry and barren if we don't spend time with Jesus. Not my words, Jesus' words. He says, abide with me. Now, when you combine that with the verses, you get this idea. Whatever you abide in, now catch this, whatever you abide in, abides in you. Whatever you hang out in, hangs out in you. If you are all about sports, then that's what's going to come out of you. If you are all about turning on your phone first thing, and that's the first thing you abide in in the morning then guess what? You're going to be all about, you know, if you're checking all your, your business emails, that's what you're going to be about all day, all day long. You'll think about that. If you're all about Facebook, online, social media, and that's your identity, and you go straight there, that's what you're abiding in. It's going to abide in you. But not only does whatever you abide in abide in you mean it's going to be in you, but also I would suggest this. Whatever you abide in first, church, abides in most what do you mean if the first thing check me on this because i know you've experienced this so have i if the first thing you do is check your work text in the morning you roll over there it is always waiting for me you get into that first that will abide in you most 
Well, what do you mean? Let's jump back. Exodus 16, 21. Read it again. They gathered it every morning, each man according to his need, but when the sun became hot, it melted. Here's what I want to suggest and leave you with today is this idea that what you abide in first abides in most. If you go to the Lord first in the day, and he's the first, you take out a clean sheet of paper with him, and you say, Jesus, be the first to write on this. That's what will abide most. But check it. Have you had this? If you go to sports first, and all of a sudden, and you're like, oh, I'll do devotions later, and you're thinking sports all day. But you get to the end of the day, you don't end up doing your devotions because the sun comes up, it gets hot out there, it gets busy out there, it gets messed up in that world out there, and if you try to grab them later in the day, sometimes it's impossible, it melts. Anything the Lord wanted to do, melted. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? And so there is a need, church, for us to be those who take out a clean sheet of paper and let the Lord be the first to write on it. I'll leave you uh, with a closing thought. I had a lot of fun last night. Got to go for a meal with your pastor and a friend of his. It was really good. And at this meal, I got down on one knee. All right, it's hard to share about, but I will. And I pulled out a ring. I had taken my wife's ring for our 20th anniversary, which is this Thursday. And I had to find a way to get it off her ring because I kind of wanted to like add some stuff to it and upgrade it. I had to find a way to get it off her finger. And so she came to me six months ago and she's like, Joel, my ring is loose, the, you know, it needs fixing, and so I'm like, okay, so I took it in, and I had this whole secret plan going on, and, and, and got the jeweler to fix it up nice, and, and then last night, you know, it, just this beautiful moment, I got down on my knee and said, babe, will you take me for the next 20 years also? And she said, can you give me some time to think about that? Um, <laughs> So, pray for us. Uh, she's not here. Um, you know, I was thinking about this morning as I was preparing this, and I thought, you know what? This is what it's like with us. This is how much we miss it. Those of you that are married, you remember that time when, you know, the doors open, your bride starts coming down and walking towards you, and the love you feel and the passion you feel, you're just overwhelmed. You're like, this is amazing. Really, Lord? This is for me? This is how it is with you and Jesus. He calls you, church, his bride. And he is not less dedicated to you now than when he first proposed to you and you accepted his invitation. He's the groom, the Bible says, and each morning he invites you to meet with him, to have intimacy, relationship, and he knows, he knows this is your ultimate fulfillment. Well, tomorrow is a new day, and my challenge to you is take out a clean sheet of paper and start afresh with the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Would you stand with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to come afresh every day. And meet with you, Jesus. Lord, we know the reason so many people don't delight in God is they don't know him very well. We know the reason they don't know him very well is they don't spend time with him. But thank you that you are full of grace and love. Thank you that you are full of forgiveness. Thank you that from the cross, you look at us and you say, I know you're but dust. And yet you willingly come again and say, meet afresh with me. I want to speak into your life. I want to be the manna from above, that bread from above, the word of God ministering to your life. Stop in this moment and listen to me because I love you. We thank you, Jesus, that you love us. And you're the God of second and third and 400th chances. We come afresh today and say, Lord, starting today, And starting tomorrow morning, speak to us afresh by your word. In Jesus' name, amen.